My name is Alexandra Getschu. I am the Associate Director of the Center for International Policy Studies, otherwise known as SIPS. And it is my special pleasure to welcome all of you from both sides of the Atlantic to our conference on protecting the victims of human trafficking in Canada and Europe. As many of you know, one of the key aims of SIPS is to facilitate dialogue between practitioners and academics on a wide range of topics related to international affairs. And I can think of fewer topics that would benefit more from this kind of conversation than the phenomenon of human trafficking, a phenomenon which affects millions of people around the world, but sadly uh, has yet to receive the kind of attention that it deserves. It is indeed still the case that very, very few victims of human trafficking are identified, and the number of convicted traffickers remains objectionably low. And this is where we come in. Uh, by bringing together experts from Canada and Europe, our aim is to shed light on the phenomenon of human trafficking with a special emphasis on the treatment of victims of trafficking. And I am delighted to co-organize this event with the embassies of Austria and Switzerland, two countries that have played very prominent roles in international efforts to shed light on the problem of trafficking and that have consistently stressed the importance of multilateral approaches to this problem, a problem which obviously transcends national boundaries. So let me take a moment to thank all the organizers of this conference, our friends at the embassies of Austria and Switzerland, the International Migration Network and the entire SIPS team for putting together what promises to be a particularly exciting and important event. We are very honored and very fortunate indeed to have with us today the ambassadors of both Austria and Switzerland, Ambassador Arno Riedel of Austria and Ambassador Matt Nobs of Switzerland. Uh, and I'm very grateful to them for making time to be with us today. We really appreciate their presence. And I would like, without further ado, to invite the Ambassador of Austria to please say a few words. Would you please join me in welcoming the Ambassador to the podium? Thank you so much. Excellencies, uh, member of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to be here today on this special occasion, an event seeking to raise awareness to a particularly gruesome form of slavery, namely human trafficking. In February this year, two eminent organizations in Europe, the OSCE, Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, currently chaired by Switzerland, and the Council of Europe, then chaired by Austria, organized a high-level conference in Vienna, entitled Not for Sale. An action plan has been developed outlining four areas of action. One of these is protection of victims. Protection of victims, this is the theme of uh, today's uh, conference. We want to move things ahead and bring some of the ongoing and crucial dialogue across the Atlantic. So our colleagues from Switzerland and ourselves decided to join forces with Ottawa University to pick up this area of action and organize a conference held here in Canada. I would like to express my warm thanks to the Center of International Policy Studies and our friends and neighbors from the Swiss Embassy for this excellent cooperation. Um, you might ask why uh, Switzerland and Austria. Now, uh, you all know that uh, Austria swears, uh, shares with Switzerland uh, the love for chocolate, for cheese, uh, for winter sports, but we share also this very strong commitment uh, for human rights. So, uh, this is a uh, cooperation that is deeply rooted and uh, has a continuation in this event. I would like 
to express my sincere appreciation to Ambassador Dichi Fisselberger, the Austrian National Coordinator in Combating Human Trafficking, as well as uh, Mrs. Betja Nestorova, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings at the Council of Europe. And you might know that uh, Canada is an uh, observer state at the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. My thanks also go to others from, the, uh, from all Ottawa, Canada and abroad who have agreed to offer their knowledge, experience and viewpoints and thereby contribute to shedding more light on the complex phenomenon before us. I look forward to a stimulating exchange of mutual enrichment. It will be a distinct honor to continue joining forces and refeed the main conclusions from today's debate, two days ahead of the EU Anti-Trafficking Day, back into the international deliberations ongoing uh, elsewhere. Thank you for uh, your attendance and thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much for your kind words, Ambassador. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite the Ambassador of Switzerland, His Excellency Dr. Nobs. Please, please welcome him. Excellencies, members of the Corps, students, ladies and gentlemen, as the Swiss Ambassador to Canada, I am uh, particularly happy about this joint conference with our good friends and close neighbors, Austria, and the University of Ottawa uh, here in this beautiful city. It is, of course, one of the primary goals of my embassy to promote Swiss interests in, in and bilateral ties with Canada a very important country and partner in many endeavors uh, that we uh, undertake. However, we also strive to create platforms for discussion of pressing international issues with other stakeholders. And this discussion today, this platform today, should serve as an example for further such discussions for which we look very much forward to being partners. Now, human trafficking is, of course, one very major such challenge, and we're pleased that this platform today, this workshop, with so prominent participants can take place. As my Austrian colleague, Ambassador de Riedl, has mentioned, the idea for this conference goes back to Switzerland's chairmanship of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, an organization of which Canada and, of course, uh, Austria are also members. And, and this goes to show how closely we cooperate, the Austrian chairmanship of the Council of Europe of the first half of 2014. As you may know, probably you don't, but I'm still mentioning it. Switzerland is in the chair for the second time uh, after 1996 of OSCE. Our chairmanship this year has been marked, of course, by the events in Ukraine, where the OSCE has tried and we feel been able to demonstrate once again its usefulness as an impartial observer and platform for the contribution to a hopefully durable solution. However, the work of the OECE is by far not limited to this crisis management. The organization provides both expertise and crucial field work in areas such as human trafficking, which may be less in the international spotlight today, 
but as a growing phenomenon deserves our attention. This is why one of the three Swiss priorities for the chairmanship this year was improving people's lives. And mind you, people who are concerned um, and victims of human trafficking can really be improved upon in terms of their life circumstance. I am really pleased to have so many experts on human trafficking here today. Let me expand, of course, a special welcome to Ruth Boymann, the OSCE's Deputy Coordinator for Combating Traffic in Human Beings. As I have learned, she will not only be contributing to our conference today, but also uses her stay in Canada for talks with various partners, which is undoubtedly a very good thing. I do wish you a great and fruitful discussion and good networking opportunities during the breaks, and I'm hopeful that our conference today, albeit small, uh, will contribute productively and substantially to the addressing of the issue. But, you know, being an old multilateralist, someone who spent weeks and months of his life at platforms and universities and meeting halls, what is being discussed today needs then translated into action as soon as possible. So I encourage you, in everything you discuss, in everything you say, keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these important remarks, Ambassador. On this note, I would like to invite my colleague, David Petrasek, uh, the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, to take the floor and open our first panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Um, welcome. The title for our first panel is The Fight to Prevent and Eradicate Human Trafficking. And the idea here is to, uh, thank you, <laughs> is to uh, survey uh, efforts both in Europe and in Canada to um, confront uh, human trafficking. And we have an excellent uh, panel uh, assembled here today, two of whom have come a long way to be with us, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and they've all promised to speak for less than 10 minutes, so that there'll be an opportunity really for an exchange uh, uh, with you. Um, we'll proceed like this, I think, uh, <clears throat> although it's a, a little different than the order on the list, but if we proceed with uh, uh, Ruth Poyman, who's the Deputy Coordinator uh, on the, uh, <coughs> for Combating uh, Human Trafficking uh, from the OSCE, and then with uh, Elizabeth Tichy Tisselberger, who's come from the Austrian government and is the uh, national coordinator for efforts in Austria to combat human trafficking. And she'll, uh, uh, Ruth will speak about the OSCE experience, particularly the experience, as we say, uh, east of Vienna. Um, and uh, Elizabeth will, will speak of the Austrian, but also the EU uh, experience, the kind of uh, Vienna and West, I suppose. We could look at it that way. And then we'll, um, uh, we're uh, Joy Smith, a very eminent Canadian parliamentarian, and perhaps the most outspoken parliamentarian on this issue in Canada, will speak about uh, efforts in Parliament uh, here in Canada. And finally, we'll have uh, Michael Holmes, who's uh, with the uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> with the uh, Department of Public Safety and uh, director of the Serious and Organized Crime Division. And so, we'll, uh, the effort, the, the intention here is to put on the table the various efforts that have been undertaken both in Europe and Canada. And then uh, that'll set a, a good stage, I hope, for the remaining discussions uh, at the conference. So uh, without further ado, if we can begin, Ruth, with you. And when you're nearing 10 minutes, I might just do something like this, just to give you a little flag. OK, thank you. Thank you for Is this working again? Is it working? OK, good. Um, Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me and the OSCE to come to the University of Ottawa. And um, I haven't been here since I was 22 years old, so it's, it's really wonderful to be back in Canada again. And thank you, ambassadors, for, your, uh, for taking the initiative on behalf of Austria and, and Switzerland to organize this together with the University of Ottawa. Um, of course, Austria is the, is the home of the OSCE. We work in Vienna, Austria, in the 
Habsburg Palace in the Hofburg. We have all of our meetings every week with the, 50, the ambassadors for the, from the 57 participating states of the OSCE. And this year, we are honored that we have the strong leadership of Switzerland. And as Ambassador Knob said this morning, the biggest challenge right now for the OSCE is to address the crisis in Ukraine and with Russia. And this, um, this organization is uniquely placed to address this crisis because, as the name says, the organization addresses both security but is also working towards uh, better cooperation between countries in Europe. And I think it's important because very few people know what the OSCE is in the world, including in Canada, though you are a participating state of the OSCE, that this is the world's largest regional security organization. As we say, it spans from Vancouver in Canada to Vladivostok in Russia. And it's made up of 57 participating states, including Canada and the US. So it spans three continents, US, Canada, and North America, all of Europe, and the former Soviet Union, including Central Asia, plus Mongolia. So it's including uh, Asia as well. And it goes from the uh, one end of the Pacific to the other end of the Pacific Ocean, <clears throat> around most of the uh, northern hemisphere of the world. Um, so in Vienna, Austria, we, have, uh, we are working at a high political level, as I mentioned, in the Hofburg, in this palace. You can imagine we have a room even bigger than this, and at the table are the 57 ambassadors every week deliberating various current issues. Uh, every week, I would say, it's Ukraine is highest on the agenda. But uh, we, um, there are many, many different issues. The OSC approaches security in a comprehensive way, including three baskets. So not just the hard security, the political and military security, but looking at it also through the economic and environmental lens, which includes migration issues and good governments and anti-corruption. I noticed that this hall is named after Huguette Labelle. So that's very apt. And, um, then maybe the heart of our work is in the third dimension, which is the hu human dimension, which is maybe the best known because that's the part where we um, monitor elections, which is very visible in the media and in the world. It's where we promote democratic institutions and human rights. Um, and that's where our work is centered. And the OSC has worked on human trafficking since um, about four, our first commitments were in 2000, actually under the Austrian um, presidency, I mean, chairmanship, I believe. And we always promoted a human rights and victim-centered approach. And we, I would say we, we, have, um, we have really catalyzed that approach in the world because the, origin, the international commitments of human trafficking of the, are under the United Nations Transnational Organized Crime Connect, uh, Convention. And it was very criminal justice focused. And we, um, we led efforts to promote a human rights and victim centered approach. And I think that's very you know, apt for the OSCE because the OSCE promotes security um, you know, through this comprehensive approach. But at the heart of the OSC's work is, is uh, the inherent dignity of the individual. And that's why we believe it is the, um, it is the business of other states to co be concerned about what happens in other, in other countries, like in Ukraine. Um, I was, <clears throat> in fact, just in Ukraine. And um, while we have our, our headquarters, our secretariat in Vienna, Austria, and all of the big meetings, we also have a network of field operations, including in Ukraine. And that's been very, very important right during this period. We also have um, monitors on the ground. And as in other crises in the world, human trafficking, um, unfortunately, um, raises its ugly head in new, in new ways. And there are also a lot of allegations of trafficking right now of all sorts of kinds, whether it's men digging ditches, forced conscription, organ, trafficking for organ removal, uh, kidnapping of girls for sexual exploitation by separatists there. And, but a lot of this is unconfirmed. So what we are trying to do is work with our mission there to um, to train, uh, first of all, our monitors, and eventually we hope to build capacity in the country to actually identify and report on and monitor what's happening, for example, and to do an assessment. Um, 
In terms of the scale of the problem, I'm sure my colleagues will also talk about this, but this is a huge issue. And it's really, I, I remember when I started working on these issues, I was working in Central Asia, and I was actually, um, this morning I had breakfast with Joyce Smith, so I was remembering this. I was actually in the Russian parliament in the Duma when I first heard about this issue. And it was co-organized with the FBI and the Immigration Naturalization Services of the US. It was a joint um, session. Uh, led by, um, at, at that time, a very strong parliamentarian in Russia. And I was so shocked because, of course, you grew up thinking that slavery was abolished 200 years ago. Um, it's illegal in every country of the world. And here we are with um, these problems, very similar problems, as one, um, one author said, now the difference is you don't see the people in chains, you have disposable people who can be used and, and dropped. This is the difference. But um, there's still a demand for cheap labor. There's still, there's unfortunately a normalization of corrupt practices in a lot of parts of the world. There's, um, I think in Canada, you have a, you are trying to raise awareness of um, the links to um, the sex industry and, and pornography and how, um, how you, you do need to look at this um, more carefully, what's behind this, and how this um, can be linked to trafficking for sexual exploitation, and um, it's not just the world's oldest profession, um, but to, to look at this more deeply. And what we do at the OSC is we try and look at um, trends um, that are happening throughout the region, and I have a few publications um, that we have here because they're, because at first, uh, the focus globally was on trafficking for sexual exploitation, and that was very understandable, especially because that was the most identified and still it's the most identified um, cases. And it was really shocking because the Iron Curtain came down and suddenly um, there were lots and lots of people who went overnight from being, um, I, I got into this issue because I met people like myself who were highly educated, skilled, who fell into the trap of trafficking and that shocked me so much that you're, the, it's like the floor can be pulled out from you in life and you can become vulnerable, though you wouldn't say that's stereotypically a vulnerable situation. and. Um, so in our office, we, we do a number of things. One, of course, our, our overall mandate is to promote the commitments of the OSCE, um, starting from our action plan and most recently with the addendum adopt, adopted in Kiev. And we also try to promote uh, knowledge to underpin policies. Um, and so some of the publications we have this morning, I just met uh, Stefan from the protocol department of foreign affairs and he's just been invited for the second time to attend an OSC event on, that's focused on uh, uh, domestic servitude trafficking um, when domestic work goes wrong and especially when domestic workers are living in uh, diplomatic households since we are an organization of diplomats and we're coming out with a handbook this year. So this is an example of how we went from a research project to um, pr policy promotion. It's now, um, there are commitments on this in the OSC. We've also updated our own staff instructions and um, presented um, them to our own staff. And we've been working with protocol departments throughout ministries of foreign affairs throughout the, the whole OSC region to uh, work to prevent uh, trafficking for domestic servitude, especially in diplomatic households. Another, we've also, we, it's, we've also worked a lot on trafficking for labor exploitation in different sectors. This, for example, is on the agricultural sector. It also, of course, occurs in construction, as you've already seen in Canada, and uh, in hospitality, in uh, tourism, and that's why we have also a new um, commitment relating to working with airline workers. We, um, it's also in fishing and in, uh, it's, some of the new trends are also uh, forced criminality and forced begging. And um, for this, we also have a new, uh, we, have, uh, we have developed recommendations towards the non implementation of the non-punishment provision so that, uh, for example, children who were forced to work in, in, cannab in a cannabis um, farm are not punished for um, work for growing uh, drugs, illegal drugs, when they were forced to do so. 
Another uh, work that we've worked on is trafficking for the purpose of organ removal. And this is a very politically sensitive um, uh, topic, not only because there's uh, still a lot of confusion about the terminology, just as there is on human trafficking, but also because it is used uh, in political purposes. Um, it's uh, been um, a big controversy in the Balkan, in the Balkans, especially during the conflict in Serbia and Kosovo, and now it's also something that's raising its head in terms of unconfirmed allegations um, between Russia and uh, and Ukraine. Um, we also work um, as, as the Canadian National Action Plan uh, across the four P's. And on uh, protection, I just want to mention another area that's very important is that we have also published um, a study that's it's both a legal and clinical study of human trafficking showing how it can amount to torture and how you, how you need to work with, with uh, victims and the legal implications. And all of these you can find online. And um, the, I, I will say um, just a few other things. I think in terms of the messages I want to leave you today that, as I said, um, we work on a human rights approach to this issue. The victim is at the center. The organization uh, sees this as part and parcel of uh, addressing security and especially human security. Um, this is not an issue that is going to go away. It's not going to be eradicated, just as now slavery is illegal all over the world, and this is still manifesting itself in new ways. And sometimes I think I've heard it all, and then I hear one more story, and I can't believe how shocked I am at this story. And I'm sure other speakers today can tell you some of the, the stories. But it's very important to cooperate, not only as in your interagency, your human trafficking task force, which I was honored to meet yesterday across different agencies and across cities and provinces, also with civil society, some of whom are present today, of course with the parliament as well, parliamentarians, and I'm, I was very honored this morning to have breakfast with Joyce Smith, who's a real um, powerhouse on this issue. It's very inspiring to uh, hear about your work. So I think you know cooperation is is key at every level, and uh, the OSC has always promoted the cooperation, especially between law enforcement and non-governmental organizations, because we think it's key in the identification, especially in the protection of victims. And we have promoted a national referral mechanism system to is institutionalize this cooperation, for example. But as I said, it will not be eradicated, and you cannot just. I mean, it's very important to help the victims and to restore the victims and to uh, give them access to justice. And I know now you also are um, including uh, restitution in Canada, which is very important for the victims. But if you don't integrate this against, across all policy areas, you will not, um, we will not get somewhere. So really, I think that's one of my, my messages is you have to look at this um, as part and parcel of what is happening in society. It's at heart about doing the right thing. It's about having the right labor policies. And I, I met also yesterday with your labor ministry and I was very heartened. I think um, Canada has one of the more progressive labor and migration policies in our region. And therefore, um, you have quite a lot in place to make it less risky for a labor migrant to come to your country. But at the same time, you need to look at what's happening to Canadians, because I heard about a lot of Canadians who are falling into the trap of trafficking, and it's not just about foreign victims. It's about women and girls in Canada, Aboriginals. It's about, it can be about men. Um, you, you need to also, you are, but you need to continue to, to look at this. And um, the last thing I just want to say in terms of one area we're working at, I could say many things, but one last thing I would like to say is that um, we, are, we have a new publication that's called Ending Exploitation, Ensuring that Businesses Do Not Contribute to Human Trafficking Duties of States and the Private Sector. Um, and we are about to release this and we're going to launch it at our upcoming conference in Vienna, Austria at the Hofburg. And it's on ethical issues in preventing uh, and combating trafficking in human beings. And um, actually, I met with one of uh, the professors here at the University of Ottawa last night, Christina, who's um, a moral philosopher who works on ethical issues and in international policy, which was very interesting. Um, 
And so we are trying, I think one of the things that we're, that I believe we're going to do with our new special representative, uh, who's actually from Kazakhstan, Madina Jarbusineva, though she's just a month old in the job, so I cannot yet uh, promise what she's going to do, but I know she's very interested in this, is to try and promote um, uh, business and human rights, um, ethical sourcing, uh, decent work in the workplace, um, and to and to talk about how, since our audience is first and foremost governments, how governments can uh, do more to put into place procurement regulations to ensure that at least their own contracts do not um, uh, do not involve any goods or services that could have been produced by trafficked persons, but also to put in place um, regulations and measures to. Uh, to um, give incentives or even to um, ensure that businesses don't contribute to human trafficking. And such laws now already exist um, in California, and one is being developed in the UK, the Modern Slavery Bill, for example. And um, because I believe that businesses themselves will only go so far, so it's important to both work at the government level to put together policies, but also um, as illustrated by some cases I've seen, it's very important to engage uh, workers and civil society um, to work at, at both ends because um, at root of human trafficking is exploitation and uh, greed cutting corners to make money, uh, whether it's intended um, to exploit people or not. Um, and in this financial crisis, it's very important to ensure that also businesses do the right thing. But I think each one of us has a part to play, whatever you're doing, whether you're a researcher, a student, an NGO, a government official, a diplomat, um, to do the right thing and to uh, respect um, other people, to uh, treat other people with dignity and that will go a long way. And I'm very honored to be with my colleagues today, and especially I wanted to also mention Ambassador Tishy Fisselberger, who is the National Coordinator of Austria, who is doing a fabulous job um, promoting um, anti-trafficking action in Europe and especially Austria. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Ambassador Tishy. You can stay here if you like, if you prefer. It's totally up to you, if well, it's more comfortable. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, will, I will stay here because I've got so many papers. Um, even though I was told to count seconds, um, I would like to start by thanking uh, the organizers very much for having invited me to this conference. Above all, the University of Ottawa and our friends from the Swiss Embassy, also my own colleagues from the Austrian Embassy here. I'm, I'm very thrilled and privileged to, to be here in this beautiful room named after Huguette Labelle, whom I've had the privilege of meeting various times in Vienna. She's a very impressive lady. She now serves as the vice president of the um, Senior Academic Council of the International Anti-Corruption Academy, which is based close to Vienna, so we have the privilege of meeting her once in a while. Uh, and I, I met her like, like, like Ruth did various times. So thank you for having me here. Uh, I don't know whether you have realized that this year's uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Kaila Satyarti, um, not got involved not only in educating uh, children in India, but also in fighting child slavery. One of the quotes I found by him, which I think gives us all a lot to think about, is that it is a myth to think that poverty gives rise to child labor. He said it's the opposite. It's child labor which gives rise to poverty. Uh, this has a lot to do with human trafficking and the way human trafficking comes about, because human trafficking always has to do with extreme poverty, with unemployment, with discrimination, with multiple disasters, with all that kind of phenomenons which give people the impression that they have no perspective at home and that they would pay any price to get away from where they are. Um, as Ruth said, uh, human trafficking is not always in the international limelight these days. We have so many disasters and crises at the moment. But if you think just one moment about it, you will find out that no international disaster or crisis is ever far away from, from human trafficking. The Taliban uh, buy children to use them as suicide attackers. Somalis trade slaves in order to buy weapons and run training camps for terrorists. 
You have hostage taking all over the place. All our countries, rich countries, have already had one or the other hostage story. Child soldiers are always a consequence of uh, human trafficking in children. The Bedouins in Sinai, they take people for hostage and blackmail their families until they would pay a sum of money. And if the families are not in a position to pay that money, they will simply kill the people and use their organs for trafficking organs. And more recently, ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, as we have heard, they pay people for recruiting new soldiers, and they have a lot of money these days. Uh, and as we could watch at least on our television, they actually take families as hostages and then ask their families to buy them back. So there's a lot of human trafficking involved in all the international crises we are witnessing, witnessing one way or another at the moment. None of this would happen if uh, these people didn't have a lot of helpers. And the international background to what is going on is that we have about 1 billion people who are hungry every day. We have 800 million working poor. Um, and on top of that, we have the pull factor of soap operas, which can be watched all over the place and which make poor people believe that if only they can make it to a richer country, they will find themselves in paradise, which of course is not the case. In Europe, we have already had 500,000 asylum applications only this year, since the beginning of this year, which is more than the year we had before. We have a huge phenomenon of mass migration, uh, which at the moment, I think, is the highest in Europe, even higher than in North America. But I am sure that the situation here in Canada is not so different. Um, of course, migration is different from human trafficking, but there is a nexus, because if you have a lot of people who want to get away, if you have this huge phenomenon of mass migration, then you inevitably have very vulnerable people among them, and the vulnerable people are the potential victims of human traffickers. I think we get the same kind of forms of human trafficking in Europe as what you get here in Canada. We have um, forced uh, prostitution, so sexual, sexual exploitation, mostly of women and girls. We have labor exploitation, which often goes relatively unnoticed. We all know it happens in agriculture. It happens on construction sites. It happens in catering, uh, in care of the elderly and the sick. It happens uh, in domestic um, work, it happens in fisheries, it happens in all kinds of murky agencies. Sometimes one doesn't think of it, but if you have some kind of glitzy, a new uh, construction site going up somewhere, uh, there may be a chain of subcontractors, uh, the last of which does the work at terrible conditions. Um, I remember myself doing a train trip here in Canada from Montreal to Quebec, uh, sitting next to a man. We had, we had wireless access in that train, which was wonderful, so I was watching my emails. And the gentleman next to me was not probably not a gentleman. He was watching for three hours a program on Russian brides. So you, he got the photographs of these girls, and he was obviously choosing a Russian bride for himself on that train ride. Um, this is quite significant of what we get. We get a lot of human trafficking being started one way or another by the internet. And we also have all kinds of murky agencies, agencies which recruit for weddings, agencies which recruit models, agencies which recruit work, and in the actual fact, sometimes they just recruit for human trafficking. So what does the international community do about it? You're all aware, I suppose, of the Palermo Protocol, which was the first international document, one of the most widely ratified conventions in the world by 163 countries, which was the first to give a definition uh, what human trafficking is, and that's the definition we all use, which is that there has to be an action like transporting somebody or housing somebody. Uh, and we, with a certain means, which is threat or coercion, um, and there has to be an action of exploitation. That is what human trafficking is all about. 
In Europe, we have even more uh, detailed legislation about this. On the one hand, there is the Council of Europe Convention, which I'm sure Petya Nesorova is going to talk a lot more about than I do. It was the first convention worldwide which focused not only on criminalizing human trafficking, but in particular on the questions what to do with the victims, how to protect them, how to lead them back into normal lives, and how to develop action so as to prevent human trafficking, among other things. In the European Union, at the moment, we probably have the most sophisticated legislation, international legislation there is at the moment on human trafficking. It goes a lot into the details, not only with a very detailed definition of what human trafficking is, that includes things like forced begging, for example, forced marriages, forced adoptions, things like that. Uh, it also uh, has a very strong uh, focus on the non-punishment uh, principle, which is that if victims of human trafficking were forced by the perpetrators to commit petty crime or whatever crime there was, and if they didn't have a chance of not committing that crime, like for example pickpocketing, then they shouldn't be punished for it. The, uh, European legislation also says that there is jurisdiction of European countries even if the crime was committed outside Europe and not only if it was committed by nationals but also if it was committed by people who just had a residence permit in the European Union. And it goes into details about how victims should be protected and that like in the work of the OSCE as described by Ruth Poyman is, is the very focus of it. If we have victims, uh, our task as a society is to do whatever it takes to lead them back into a normal life, if that can be done. So victims are entitled not only to shelter and to food and to medical care, but also to have legal advice when it comes to a court case, to have psychological support, and if necessary, even to become member of a victim's protection program that might even go as far as giving them a different identity, if that is required to protect them from the perpetrators. A European uh, Union also has a strategy on, on preventing human trafficking and that is a big word because what is preventing human trafficking? What we are doing today is certainly part of awareness raising and any kind of prevention always starts by awareness raising but of course the awareness raising is not enough. There is so much else to do. Uh, I know you have a national strategy on combating human trafficking here in Canada. We have the same. I must admit I haven't read yours, but I suspect uh, it, it is organized much uh, around the four Ps, prevention, uh, protection, prosecution, and partnership, as is ours. I think that is very important. In Austria, we have a task force uh, whose president I have the privilege of being. And I think the, the most successful and most important thing about our task force is that a number of NGOs working in the area of human trafficking are full members of our task force. And they are the people on the ground. They talk to the victims, they shelter the victims, they're usually the first to meet the victims. They know exactly what is going on and they tell us from the government what we should be doing. We cannot always fulfill all the NGOs wishes and uh, recommendations, but we try our best. Uh, human trafficking is an extremely complex phenomenon. Uh, the perpetrators are always much better at handling that complexity than governments are. But what we need to do is to find complex answers. That was one of the results of the conference we have all organized together in Vienna at the beginning of February this year, which has already been mentioned. And I really think we need to go on uh, fighting together, uh, being well aware of that complexity, and that is where I, I see your sign. I'm coming back to the Nobel Prize winner who said um, it is not that poverty <laughs> creates child labor, it's the other way around. Uh, and that quote just shows that what we really need to do is to tackle the root causes, uh, which can be a very um, disillusioning statement these days where we have so many international crises. But we have no other chance but to just try to go on and do whatever it takes to fight that terrible phenomenon. Thank you very much for your attention.
Joy Smith, please. <coughs> Well, good morning. It's so good to see you here. And I have to congratulate SIPS, University of Ottawa, and um, of course, uh, OISI, and um, Australia, Switzerland, all the main players who've put this on today. And when I look across the room, the many familiar faces, I want to have a special welcome to the staffers sitting out there who uh, have come to see what this conference is all about here in Ottawa. You are a hope for the future and everybody sitting here and it was such a pleasure to have breakfast with Ruth this morning. Uh, we have uh, an instant sistership I think uh, going there Ruth. So um, I want to tell you about human trafficking because human trafficking in Canada wasn't recognized uh, just nine years ago, we had our first law on human trafficking. It was Bill C-49, and uh, it came into play 2005, but it was a general law. It was a very good one, but a general law. And so there's a lot of things that happened in the last 10 years. I have to say I'm not a very good politician. I have to say that I really didn't want to get into politics, but the human trafficking issue, issue absolutely drove me here. So I'm going to tell you about the real world here in Canada because my son is a cop. He did an awful lot to work with victims of human trafficking to rescue. And a shout out goes out to all the police officers that are working very hard on this issue today. So I came to Parliament because I thought here in Canada we needed laws to combat human trafficking. So when I first came here, um, it was strange. Nobody seemed to know about it. Everybody thought that uh, apparently it happened in every other country but Canada. Guess what? It happened nine minutes from where you're sitting right now with Mrs. Emerson when she trafficked three girls, 15 and a half year old girl. And it, it happens in every city, in the countryside. My first victim was taken out of a basement in Saskatchewan, rural Saskatchewan and she was 14 years old. Human trafficking is when, just to be clear, when a victim is targeted and perpetrators make between $260,000 to $280,000 a year off a victim. So it's all about the money and they don't stay in it very long. People don't know this. It should come out one day, but they stay in about four or five years. Why? Because they want to run and hide and spend their money and give what they call, they give the cattle call out there that's the girls and boys. I have a Hell's Angel out of Toronto, out of, well, he, he went through Winnipeg, uh, Toronto, all over, and um, I gotta tell you, he trafficked people. Today, he t completely turned his life around, and he has a home in Toronto right now for boys who were trafficked, because more and more boys, young boys, are being trafficked in this country. And he's done amazing things. In fact, I'm giving him an award at the end of uh, October for his courageous work of getting out of crime and actually helping those who were trafficked. So here in Canada, ladies and gentlemen, it happens every day. It's a very serious thing. I had in my own office a young woman come to see me. She was a mom. And uh, she, had, she was upper middle class, like a lot of the Staff people are, especially when they get into the higher echelons here on Parliament Hill, but her 16-year-old daughter was trafficked. And she was absolutely mortified about what happened to her. Because traffickers do earn a lot of money. So we're talking about what happened here in our Parliament in Canada to eradicate human trafficking, and a lot has happened. In January 2009, the Canadian government announced a partnership with Crime Stoppers to launch a national hotline for human trafficking. Because you see, when it first started, a way back in 2005, it was because of a study on the uh, status of women. And read that study. It's, uh, it's called Turning Outrage Into Action. So the people that kind of laughed about human trafficking happened in Canada. When I got it on the status of women, I was able to bring in the victims. You know what? I found out that the reason people don't take it seriously is they just don't know. That's all. I learned a lot from that. 
I was kind of bitter when people were saying, oh, there's no human trafficking. I've worked with victims for 14 years before I came to Parliament. But they just didn't know. And they produced, multi-party, produced one of the best uh, action plans I've ever seen. It's turning outrage into action. You should read it, public. So in 2010, I was fortunate enough to get my bill, uh, 268, mandatory minimums for traffickers of children 18 years and under, through Parliament on all sides of the House. And I congratulate all parliamentarians on that because that was in a minority government. So the Canadian hearts, the Canadian parliamentarians' hearts were turned when they found out the truth. Human trafficking was under the public radar screen here in Canada for a very long time. If it hadn't been my son, who's RCMP, I would never have been able to know what really went on. But I knew with a gigantic impact because of all the victims that I started working with. September 2010, the Canadian government joined uh, our RCMP here in Parliament to launch the Crime Stoppers Blue Blindfold campaign to bring awareness about human trafficking to Canadian citizens. People don't talk about blue blindfold very much, but I think it's very important because awareness, education is our greatest weapon, and that's why I congratulate the University of Ottawa here to have this forum here in the seat of learning is very important. In May 2011, um, we developed a national action plan. I wrote the, po of the prototype to that, it was called Connecting the Dots, and it was adopted in, um, in, in, um, in that year. Uh, in June two, uh, 2012, I put forth another bill, because human trafficking, you know, Ruth and I were talking this morning, and what a dynamic woman, uh, and OIC, what a, a, a dramatic and, and dynamic organization with all the countries they work with. And you know, we have to join hands. We have to cooperate. Education is our greatest weapon. When I, when I listened um, to the, the presentation uh, uh, by Elizabeth, uh, it, it was just, I mean, it could have been here in Canada. It's the same old story, same old, same old. It's human trafficking. To put it right down, to the bottom line. It's the buying and selling, particularly of our youth, and they're make, making a heck of a lot of money out of it. And it's been too long under the public radar screen. It's been too long in a silo where people were uh, just talking about it from their country. Now we're joining hands. That's why I flew in late last night about midnight, and I have to fly out again in just a couple of hours uh, for another commitment, but I felt it was so important to be here today to join hands with you and to, uh, as, as a global community, to stop human trafficking. And if you think it can't happen to you, if you think it can't happen to your families, well, I could tell you many, many stories that it certainly can. It touches many families, but they don't talk about it. Why? Because they're embarrassed. And often the victims don't want their parents or anybody to even know about it or tell them about it if they're fortunate enough to survive. In uh, June 2012, the National Action Plan that we've talked about used the, the four Ps again, or the three Ps, or prevention, pr um, protection, and prosecution. Of course, the fourth one is working in partnership, which I've just talked about. That National Action Plan was so unique because for the first time, it talked about rehabilitation for the victims, it talked about training for the police officers, and let's talk about that. It, I don't care. I've met many police officers. I love the police officers. I give a shout out to them. My own son is a police officer. But a lot of them don't understand human trafficking because they haven't had the opportunity to be trained. And human trafficking is a very unique, clandestine, manipulative crime that remained under the public radar screen, under the guise of prostitution. Behind that prostitution, often, there was a human trafficking story. Under the guise of poverty, behind that poverty was the guise of, of uh, really human trafficking and people being used and abused. So it's the buying and selling of people, plain and simple. And the perpetrators make a heck of a lot of money out of it, tax-free. That's why it has to stop. That's why these laws are very important. Now, um, currently the uh, Bill 30, uh, C-36 has uh, been brought forward under uh, Peter McKay. Um, it's a fantastic bill. It's based, uh, I believe, on the Nordic model, 
where there's recognition of targeting the pimps and the johns. And, and number two, uh, providing for the, the victims of human trafficking to get out. Because you see, when you work with a human traffic person, um, it takes, it's a long road back. It's a long road back. And it takes the confidence of people around them to help the victims become confident. You see, last Christmas here in Canada, we had a, a Christmas gift from the Supreme Court of Canada. They collapsed all the, or made, rendered unconstitutional all the laws around prostitution. It was a free-for-all. The one wise thing they did was they gave the government, and I'm talking about all parties, I know we're in government, but this takes everybody, uh, to construct a bill that would answer uh, their proclamation about collapsing or rendering the, the uh, laws around prostitution illegal or unconstitutional. So Bill C C36, the bill I'm talking about, uh, is that bill. And for the first time in Canadian history, the buying of sex will be illegal, period. For the first time in Canadian history, the victims, and I call them victims, and after they get out, I call them survivors. But those are the ones that provision will be uh, provided for so they can get out and rebuild their lives. So this is a very important bill. We have until December 19th to pass that bill. And if we don't, it's a free-for-all for everybody. And nothing, there's nothing good about legalizing prostitution at all. Nothing. When I see some of the uh, associations that come up and talk, you find out their backgrounds, they're making a lot of money out of controlling a whole lot of girls. So, you know, I wanted to uh, just also tell you about some cases. You'll recognize them about the young girl who fell in love. The boyfriend gave her everything. Gave her dinners out, gave her flowers, told her how beautiful she was. But the goal of every perpetrator is to take their victim away from their support systems. And what are support systems? Families, schools, sports groups, their support systems, could be their church. Everything they take them away from. When they get them uh, out of those support systems, they, they just ask for their identification to keep for, for, for their sake so they won't lose it, you know. Somehow they get their driver's license, they get all their identification. And if you yourself ever thought, where would you be in a city without your identification? Without your identification, you're miss or missus or mister nothing. You can't do anything. You can't even catch a bus. So what happens then? They're taken to uh, their place of work. They're raped, often they're shot up with drugs. The high-end ones, they don't shoot them up so readily because uh, they want them to be awake and alive and look real pretty. Uh, that's, that is Cassandra's story. I'll call her Cassandra. Another story is when Grandpa used porn on the internet to condition his granddaughter at age five, raped her at age six, and turned her out on the streets, making money off her while mommy and daddy were at work. Then eventually, they lost track of her. She became a, a teenager and she just went out on her own. That's Jessica, and that's from white, modern, middle-class Canada. Um, probably you don't know this, but I'm an honorary chief. I have the red shawl. Um, uh, the Manitoba Assembly of Chiefs gave it to me, but I got it the hard way. I got it by understanding and rescuing kids. How do the perpetrators work with the Aboriginal kids? They go up to the reserves, and they learn their culture, and they become their friends, and it can be men, it can be women. And then they bring them down out of their communities and often there's a language barrier. I know my son speaks uh, Ojibwa and Soto, but often they, they come to middle class uh, Canada, town or city, and it can be a town or city, it happens out of towns too. And then the same thing happens to them that happens to every, every other victim. I've had a Manny Nick Pangi's victim, I'll call her Eve, 
Um, he was the first uh, trafficker that was convicted in Canada. His, uh, we hit her all across Canada because Jerome, the enforcer, the bodyguard, really the enforcer, not the bodyguard, he was in jail and he was going to get out and beat the pulp out of her because she, went, she got away. Unfortunately, what happened with her is her family rejected her because it was her fault that she got involved with the, the boyfriend. But you know what? Last Christmas, we bought her a coat because it's pretty cold here in Canada. And she graduated grade 12 and she's carrying on to post-secondary and what a victor that is. So there's survivors all over the place. There's stories all over the place. The 10-year-old boy. I'll just uh, end off with that. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, the 10-year-old boy who was addicted to porn. I know I did an interview with the Post and they said, you don't have a 10-year-old boy who's addicted with porn. Anyway, the parents called the National Post and straightened that out. And they came to Ottawa and they found out in their school divisions that porn was being inadvertently um, popping up over on the internet. Now, porn conditions traffic victims. So anyway, with that, here in Canada, I'm very, very proud that we're alive and well. We've got really good bills going in. I'm really, really proud to be here with all you experts and uh, with Michael Holmes, special place in my heart, your, your police officer. And I have to say to you that it takes a nation, it takes a globe to stop this horrendous crime. So thank you so much for being here this morning. Good on you. Michael, please. Morning, everyone. Uh, first thing I have to do is clarify that I'm not a police officer. Um, but um, I am a policy analyst with uh, Public Safety Canada, which that puts me in quite a different world than than law enforcement, but certainly supportive of uh, law enforcement efforts in Canada, and particularly on this issue. Um, so thanks very much to um, the embassies of Austria and Switzerland for organizing this meeting along with the Institute. Uh, it's very much appreciated, and I'm pleased to be here uh, to represent Public Safety Canada. And I'd also like to thank my fellow presenters for their ex excellent remarks uh, so far. Uh, today I'm going to give a brief overview of um, human trafficking in Canada and Canada's response to it uh, through the National Action Plan to combat human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking is often described as a form of modern day slavery and involves the recruitment, transportation and harboring of persons and or control of their movements for the purpose of exploiting them typically through sexual exploitation or through forced labour. In Canada, while the majority of victims uh, are female Canadians trafficked for sexual exploitation, there's increasingly, um, um, be, it's increasingly being found that um, forced labor is uh, being discovered and um, uncovered of involving foreign nationals, and this is something that is, is sort of an emerging trend in Canada. Uh, the most common situation in Canada is the grooming of girls and young women by traffickers, uh, pimps, gangs and peers who may use romance and other forms of, of convincing and luring to gain the trust of the victims. They prey on the vulnerabilities of the victims by offering them a place to stay, a good job and lots of money. Of course, we know that this is not how it ends up. Women who have been trafficked tell us that they were recruited, lured, or groomed as girls, usually between the ages of 11 and 15, with the average age being at about 13. Uh, they are forced to provide multiple sex acts per day, turning their income over to their traffickers. Uh, as of August 2014, there have been 76 completed convictions of traffickers in Canada. In June 2012, as we've heard, Public Safety Canada launched the National Action Plan to Combat Human Trafficking, which, which consolidates the government of Canada's efforts to combat this crime. The National Action Plan proposes strategies that better support organizations providing assistance to victims and helps protect foreign nationals, including young female immigrants who arrive in Canada alone from being subject to illegitimate, illegitimate or unsafe work. 
The key to the long-term success of the National Action Plan is communication, collaboration and engagement with partners in the field, including engaging with like-minded countries like Austria and Switzerland, which have taken great strides to combat this crime. The Human Trafficking Task Force, which I chair for Public Safety Canada, is comprised of eight to ten government departments and agencies and is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the National Action Plan. In December 2013, the 2012-2013 first annual report on progress stemming from the National Action Plan was released. The annual report speaks to advances the Government of Canada has made in all our efforts and our approach uh, consistent with the four principles that we've heard about so far, prevention, protection, prosecution and partnerships. Some of the initiatives reported on in the report include enhanced information sharing and coordination of anti-human trafficking efforts across jurisdictions throughout Canada through quarterly federal provincial territorial conference calls and, and through conference calls with uh, non-governmental organizations, federal, provincial, territorial government agencies and departments, municipalities, and through web forums uh, addressing and focusing on human trafficking. Mm, public Safety has partnered with the National Association of Friendship Centers to develop a human trafficking awareness campaign targeting Aboriginal populations, which is a key element uh, in Canada's approach to addressing human trafficking. This campaign was very positively received and was rolled out early this, earlier this year. The RCMP has launched its I'm Not For Sale National Youth Awareness Campaign and Employment Skills and Development Canada and Citizenship and Immigration Canada have increased their outreach to foreign nationals and temporary foreign workers who may be subject to human trafficking. Also in December 2013, the Minister of Public Safety announced the RCMP-led Human Trafficking Enforcement Team, uh, which will work closely with law enforcement in Quebec, in the province of Quebec, to fight trafficking in Canada and abroad. <coughs> Further achievements include providing funding to community organizations and provinces to develop training programs, such as online tra the, the online training program for first responders, and service providers who may come into contact with victims of human trafficking. The development of a local safety audit guide to prevent trafficking persons and related exploitation for use at the local level to inform efforts to prevent trafficking and related forms of exploitation. Amendments to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act uh, to provide regulations for further protection to temporary foreign workers, including ensuring that employers make reasonable efforts to provide a safe workplace free of abuse. The provision of funding to a number of different organizations, international and non-governmental organizations in Canada that work with governments to address human trafficking. And participation in a number of multilateral, international and domestic uh, events to support global anti-trafficking efforts and to promote domestic achievements abroad. Under the National Action Plan, our government committed to enhancing engagement and collaboration with civil society to support knowledge exchange, strengthen partnerships, and inform policy responses. To respond to this commitment, in fall 2012 and early winter 2013, public safety engaged in online and in-person consultative uh, efforts with anti-human trafficking stakeholders and experts across the country. Further to this, on January 29th and 30th in 2014, Public Safety hosted a national forum on human trafficking that took place in Ottawa. And this forum included over 100 participants. So there's an attempt to reach out very broadly and engage people across the country. These consultation and engagement activities provide an opportunity to enhance our knowledge of current and emerging trends, goals, gaps and challenges, and priority areas of focus related to human trafficking in Canada. The findings from the consultations and the forum will be used to inform future federal, federal efforts. And the summary report from the 2014 forum will be released in the coming weeks. Moving forward in 2014-2015, the Government of Canada will provide up to $500,000 annually for projects to enhance services and supports for victims through the, Justice, the Department of Justice Victims Fund 
continue to engage with the anti-human trafficking community via regular conference calls and web forums. And in the coming weeks, there will be the release of two research studies that public safety has, has supported, uh, one focusing on labor trafficking, and the second reporting on issues and trends related to trafficking of Aboriginal women and girls, including family trafficking and the involvement of gangs and criminal organizations. We'll also explore opportunities to work with provinces and territories, develop training for provincial employment standards and occupations health and safety officers, as well as fire and building code inspectors. Canada is also exploring government procurement and supply chain management relating to human trafficking. Finally, as mentioned earlier, the National Action Plan Annual Report for 2013 will be released in the coming weeks, along with a summary report of the January 2014 National Forum. While there's a great deal of work ahead, we're hopeful that the, hopeful that the government of Canada is taking steps in the right direction, both domestically and internationally, to address human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, we now have uh, 30, 35 minutes for some uh, question and answers and, and uh, for some discussion. Uh, and, and I would welcome people to approach the microphones if you have questions for the panelists. And I would just ask that if you do so, just please quickly introduce yourself and, and do put a, a question to the panelists. Um, it's always hard to break the ice. I've got a whole list of questions here. so. <laughs> but I don't want to monopolize it. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Patty Lennard. I'm a faculty here at the University of Ottawa and a colleague of David's. And my question is a general one for the panelists or possibly for the last two most in particular. My question is about the distinct responses we ought to have to victims both of uh, sex trafficking as distinct from trafficking into other forms of labor construction uh, agriculture and so on, are there distinct responses that we should be thinking about for these respective classes of victims? And secondly, um, Michael, you mentioned that there are people are being trafficked not only into uh, set to sex, the sex industry, but also to a range of industries. And my question is, um, uh, some of these people are, be, are men and some of them are women, and are there distinct responses that we should be thinking about when we're trying to get men and women distinctively out of uh, trafficking experiences? So, so I'm wondering about the sort of the set of responses and whether they're different according to gender and according to industry into which people are trafficked. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Who would like to have a stab at that one? A very good question. Differentiated responses based on the destination industry, if we want to say, and then the, the, the gender issue. Do you want to? Yes, go ahead, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. thank you very much for that interesting question. Um, our experience is that, first of all, they, they say there is a majority of uh, victims in terms of sexual exploitation. So we are talking about 80% of victims um, who are female, at least according to the statistics and the studies which are being done in the European Union, but I suppose it is not so different here. If you look at the figures which you get from the ILO, the International Labour Organization, you will find that they have spotted a majority of um, male victims because they're mo more focusing on labour exploitation. All the figures you get actually show that there are huge discrepancies between what we know, uh, victims which have been identified and court cases which have been conducted, and the estimates which we have, which are a multiple number of those. In any case, from experience with working with the victims which we have in Europe, yes, you need very different responses, uh, in, depending on whether you have female victims of sex trafficking or whether you have mostly male victims in labor exploitation. Even though you have to realize that some of the sectors where you find labor exploitation are basically female, things like care of the elderly, domestic work, and so on. Uh, and these are actually the sectors which are expanding in spite of the fact that we have an international economic crisis. So we have very different answers to these phenomena. We have an NGO which is government funded and whose task is to take care of female victims. Uh, they have uh, given recommendations to a center which has been uh, created in Austria only during the last year, which is specifically uh, aimed at taking care of male victims of trafficking, and it shows that psychologically, and from all other factors, this is a totally different story. 
uh, because men tend to talk less about what happened to them, even less than the women. We know we have already a vicious circle of victims not talking to the police and at court because they're being threatened by the perpetrators. As a consequence of that, we don't have enough convictions. As a consequence of that, we don't have perpetrators who go to prison, and if they do, they don't stay very long. They go on running their business from prison sometimes because their assets are not being uh, conf confiscated. And because the assets have not, not been confiscated, no compensations are paid out to victims. So this is a vicious circle which we try to break. We now have a government fund which is available for paying out compensation to victims, actually. But in this vicious circle where you never get hold of the big fish because the victims don't talk, you see that it's even worse, even more difficult if you have male victims because they are traumatized in a different way they find it even more difficult to have confidence in the people who are trying to take care of them. So they need an entirely different response, and they probably need that response for a much longer time before they can find their way back uh, into a normal life. And so since we have less male victims than female victims so far, uh, this is quite a strain on the structures we have so far. That is as far as I can say about very this. Very helpful. <coughs> Joy, did you want to answer this too, yeah? Um, GBJ too as well. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, in Canada, um, primarily the sex trafficking, uh, there's been an increase in, in males this past five years for some reason. Uh, a lot of the trafficking comes between the US and Canada right now and back and forth. Um, the victims themselves, when you work with a female victim in Canada here, uh, and the males, both of them, they have post-traumatic stress. That's something that people are talking now with frontline uh, front uh, responders like police officers and firefighters that are first on the scene and, and people from the military. The same characteristics are presenting themselves, modern day slavery, with these victims. Um, what we have found is we, they need uh, de-escalation de time. They need just quiet time in a safe place. It, 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 they have a, a great deal of trouble, as Elizabeth said, talking to the police. That is just off the radar. And the reason being is they were, they're so conditioned, they're threatened that they're going to be beaten or someone's going to be killed. And we had one of the largest forced labor um, cases in Ontario uh, about a year and a half ago. I was personally involved in that particular case, and it had to do with men. And they were in the basement and they were living in terrible conditions. They were abused terribly. But for them, they, they were just living in fear because they were from Hungary and the Hungary Mafia was trying to cross the border to, and they had a hit list of 12 people. So they had that, that fear. But over and above that, I know one of the victims just uh, committed suicide on a railroad track. The oldest one, he could never get over the human trafficking, so they need a lot of counseling, they need de-escalation time, they need people around them, and I know the girls, one of the victims that we rescued uh, in Toronto, she, she had no clothes, she had no food, she had no nothing, they, they need the necessities of life, but it's rebuilding that confidence. So uh, there are some similarities between the men and the women in, to in terms of post-traumatic stress, they have all the symptoms. But over and above that, um, I would say, Elizabeth, yeah, it's very hard for the, uh, for the men to talk about anything. Uh, but it's a mixture in Canada of both now. Ruth, quickly, yeah. Um, I just want to um, d direct you maybe to some resources that are out there. One, um, there is a publication about uh, trafficking in men by Ruth Rosenberg. I'm not gonna go into what it's about. And there's also, um, since both Elizabeth and Joy mentioned, um, uh, well, victims who don't always want to be identified or the stigma or the hesitation and, and the gender aspects of that. Um, there are two papers that in general are looking at uh, things from a victim perspective that might be interesting to see. One is called Listening to Victims of Trafficking. Um, and one is why, why victims refuse assistance, and they're both by a researcher called Rebecca Surtees. 
and basically there's very little on offer. And I, I have worked with both female and male victims. I don't, I'm not a service provider, but I ha I, when I first started working on this, I worked on cases where both women and men had been trafficked in the same, um, in the same uh, labor trafficking scenario. There was also torture and sex sexual, exploitation, sexual exploitation that happened at the same time. So I think it depends um, more on the form than necessarily on the gender. I've met women who wouldn't self-identify. I've met men who wouldn't. I've, met, I've seen stigma and shame on both sides. Um, it also depends, of course, on the culture, the community, the family. Um, I think one of the important things to do also in prevention work, and I don't remember who said something that was related to this, is kind of peer-to-peer -peer work, teacher, family work, um, you know, community work, um, because so much, you know, there was a campaign I was involved in also where, you know, kids didn't tell, I guess it was about the boyfriend scenario, about being um, lured somewhere, whereas they were or about a job offer. Uh, they didn't realize they were being lured, but they were getting a job offer. And But you tell your friend about what, you consult with them on what model cell phone you'll buy. So why don't you also share information when you get offers which sound too good to be true. Um, <coughs> lastly, I just want to tell you that this, this publication that I mentioned on trafficking in human beings amounting to torture and other forms of ill treatment, as I said, it's a legal and clinical study on the legal side, it was the Austrian Boltzmann Institute who um, did the, the work, and it, um, and it goes on the legal implications for both men and women. It's more, this, this study on the clinical side is more about sexual exploitation. It includes cases of both men and women who've been sexually exploited. Um, and I would say the trauma is quite similar, but you should read the, the paper yourselves. But it comes from uh, a vast um, amount of work that's done by the Helen Bamber Foundation in the UK. Um, who's worked uh, also was connected to Amnesty where David used to work. Um, and it's, it looks at the clinical side of what happens to victims in terms of trauma and I think you can, you can see that it's, it's more, I would say, it's more based on the individual and contextual rather than the, the gender, though of course, um, you know, that's a Gender is an interesting, an interesting issue, and I, I remember when I first started working on these issues in a certain part of the world, um, you know, trafficking for sexual exploitation. It was, it was also considered just to be about women, and oh, it's, you know, it's easier to accept that a woman is a trafficking. So it's a perception also of those who are looking at trafficking that the women are vulnerable. It's about sexual exploitation. And it's harder to identify a man because you don't think about them in your stereotypical idea of what a victim is. And, but of course, a lot of victims of any kind are actually people who are strong people, who are ambitious, who are trying to improve their life, who are trying to, uh, you know, they're often people who are trying to um, care for their family. They might have sick children. Um, they might have an ailing parent, and they've decided to uh, you know, what would look to us to be a risk to go and uh, get a job in another place or another city, and then they, they fall into a scenario which ends up being uh, trafficking. And, uh, you know, there are actually people, they, I've met people who are educated, who were um, not from poor families, but they didn't, they wanted to realize their um, education, their expectations of life, and they didn't feel like they would be able to realize themselves in a place where either there was an illegitimate government or there was a corrupt society. Uh, they wanted to raise their children in an honest society. They wanted more opportunities or there was a crisis or a conflict. So it's very, it's very complicated. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question to look more into. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Okay, uh, my name is Tom Allen, and I'm uh, here from the office of the official opposition's critic for human rights, uh, Wayne Marston. He's also the uh, vice chair of the House C Subcommittee on International Human Rights, which is a little known, but uh, very, very interesting uh, committee on the Hill that does very important work. Okay, so uh, my question, I have a couple questions. I wanted to, uh, Ms. Uh, Poyman, I uh, wanted to ask you, in your remarks, you uh, mentioned monitors. And uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on what the monitors uh, do. Do they work with law enforcement? Are they out in the field with uh, civil society? Or are they both? At what level uh, do they 
do their work. And I have a, a, another question for Mr. Holmes. Uh, the action plan that you discussed, I was wondering if there are provisions in place by which every few years you can gauge the success or failure of the plan itself. Do you have uh, metrics or targets, uh, someone tracking the numbers of traffickers who have been prosecuted, uh, someone uh, keeping an eye on how many people are being rescued and reintegrated. Uh, basically, if you could talk about that, I'd very much appreciate it. And that's, okay. that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Let's start with you, Michael, and then we'll come to, to Ruth. OK, thanks for your question. Yes, there, are, uh, there is an evaluation that will occur of the National Action Plan on a regular basis and you know, with uh, basically um, in, consistent with all uh, programs and policies that we pursue. Uh, they're evaluated on a regular basis. Um, the metrics um, would uh, be oriented towards how we engage with others, the, uh, uh, the steps that are outlined in the action plan itself and, and whether we've taken them, uh, how we've engaged, how often we've engaged with stakeholders, uh, the kinds of um, research uh, that we've produced and information we've disseminated, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the difficulties that we face on an ongoing basis really in, uh, in terms of um, developing appropriate policy responses is getting the right kind of data. And uh, that is, um, we really need to rely on our stakeholders, uh, law enforcement and NGOs who are involved sort of on the front line to um, have them inform us on the extent of the problem and, and, and how we would measure up in terms of um, uh, the effectiveness and measuring the success of the, of the action plan itself. Um, there have been 74 convictions of, expo of um, sexual exploitation in Canada. Uh, I don't know the trend of that exactly, but um, the greater awareness that we place on the issue and the more that um, we see that it's not just sexual exploitation but labor market exploitation as well, um, and the focus that's put on it politically, I think we will see those numbers increase over time. And, and the, the evaluation you're speaking about is a public? I think that was part of the question. Is it a public? Yeah, I think the evaluation would be made public uh, once, it's, uh, once it's produced. Yeah. Um, Ruth, there was a question for you about monitors. Yeah, well, um, the monitors that I mentioned were specifically in Ukraine, which is related to the crisis right now that's going on. And the OSCE decided early on, once um, the violence um, escalated, that um, there needed to be um, monitors on the ground to, as the Swiss ambassador said this morning, to conduct impartial observation of the situation as much as, as possible in a, in a conflict area. So even though the monitors, which are, um, there are several hundred now, they're all over Ukraine, most of them are located in eastern Ukraine where um, the conflict is occurring and um, they are uh, working with everybody and when I, I we met with the head of this the chief of the special monitoring mission a few weeks ago in, in uh, Kiev and they are often I mean they're they're trying to monitor but they they also don't there's not enough people and there are not enough resources but they're often called to come to a spot to uh, observe something that's happened, whether it's a bombed building, whether it's an alleged mass grave, and then they document it, and they don't uh, take a position on it, they document a fact. Last week in the Permanent Council in Vienna, there was a presentation on the borders, and it was just literally pictures of the border areas, aerial photographs, and then statistics on what was going across the borders one way or another. And you can surmise from the facts, you know, how many coffins were going from Ukraine to Russia, various things, but this is left to uh, individual in interpretation. Um, and, but it helps the OSCE get to the bottom of what's happening to try and present um, impartial facts. But what we are doing, and if, yes, they work with individual people, they work with civil society, they work with the media, they were very visible, of course, when the MH17 tragedy happened and they were on the ground first when other international uh, weren't, weren't able to have access there, they, they helped provide that. So it's, it's something very unique, the OSC and important the OSC is doing under the leadership of the Swiss chair in office this year. And what we're trying to do with these monitors is educate them because there were these alleged mass graves with alleged trafficking for organ removal 
and the observers themselves found two graves with two people in them so far. Um, and they're in a state of decomposition, so you can't tell that anything happened to them. So this is just to say that, but nevertheless, on Russian TV, you have nonstop information about mass graves and organ trafficking. So, you know, I think it's, they're trying to establish facts, get the facts out to the participating states, and then have uh, responses put in place. And this is just, you know, an example in one uh, very, very critical um, area, area of, of responsibility now that we're working in. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> if no one else advances to the mic, okay, please. Good morning. My name is uh, Chantal Chastenay. I come from the Department of Foreign Affairs, International Trade and Development from the Office of Protocol. And you may wonder how we relate to the discussion this morning, but I just wanted to share with you the small role that we play in uh, Canada's uh, action plan. And it relates, my division is responsible for the diplomatic community here accredited to Canada. And uh, so we uh, have a policy to try to protect uh, as much as we can foreign uh, workers in diplomatic household, and this was mentioned by uh, Mrs. Poyman. Um, and uh, you've mentioned how collaboration is key. We have stre strengthened our policy this summer uh, in consultation with some like-minded, and we also work very closely with uh, local uh, local uh, um, partners here, uh, including uh, our colleagues uh, in other departments such as CIC, CBSA, public safety, but also with RCMP and with the local. Uh, law enforcement policy. So uh, I thank you very much for including us this morning. If you are interested to know what we do uh, with regards to protecting foreign domestic workers, our policy and guidelines are available on the internet side of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and International Development under the Office of Protocol. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Um, maybe if you allow me, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, if I may. Uh, in the European Union and with the Austrian context, but the European Union context more broadly, you mentioned you know, the range of interventions that are needed, and we've heard about these four Ps, and of course everyone has correctly uh, pointed to the complexity of the problem, and that there, you know, what we take from that is there is no one magic bullet, there's no one solution here or there. Um, given that though, given that, given the experience you've had in Austria and also your awareness of the European Union context, would you point to a particular policy or a particular intervention where you've seen real success? Uh, is it on the awareness raising side, on the prosecution side, on the partnership side? Is there something that's emerged in the last 10 or 15 years in the European context where you can really say, that, you know, this really seems to be working? Um, again, against the backdrop of saying there is no one, one policy that will work, we need many. But what would you point to as being really successful? This is the $10,000 question, I suppose. What works? That's what we're all looking for. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there's one thing that one can pinpoint as, as, as the thing that works. Um, certainly, what we are all doing more and more is training different professional groups, because you only spot the problem when you know what to look for. So we are training not only police, but also people who work at courts, prosecutors and judges, teachers, medical staff. We train consular staff because very often they are the first interface between a potential victim and a potential uh, perpetrator and, and our own authorities. Uh, that works to a certain extent because people become more aware. We have a hotline that one can contact when one becomes aware of something. Arguably, the one measure that might be most uh, efficient is the one none of our countries really manage to use sufficiently, and that, I think, would be confiscating the assets of, of the perpetrators. Uh, we sometimes manage to put them into prison. I think it's not the big fish we catch. Uh, we, we only catch the, the, the sort of go-betweens. But if we could manage to actually make it economically less interesting, or at least more risky, that would make a dent, I think. Because at the moment, what we get, this is one of the most riskless crimes you can commit. It happens very seldom that somebody gets imprisoned, and even less often that the real assets are gone. So they just try again and again. And this, I think, is something which is going on more in Europe now, because it's one of the specific features of that new, new directive in Europe that assets need to be confiscated. 
we have in Vienna now a specialized court which deals with human trafficking and they try to make sure they confiscate assets as quickly as they can and I think that that is a key to success but it's hard to use it often enough. Okay, I don't know if <coughs> any of the other panelists want to address that question, just you know, the, the one single policy intervention given your experience that you've seen in the last decade or so that you'd really point to, confiscation of assets perhaps through this special court would be interesting to hear more about. Does anyone else want to come in on that point, Ruth? Uh, first of all, as far as what Ambassador Sashi Fisselberger uh, just said, I agree with her. And just, I forgot to mention one thing because it's a, a credit card size. It's not this big, so I forgot to show you. But it's also a recent publication that's called Leveraging Anti-Money Laundering Regimes to Combat Trafficking in Human Beings. And on here, it's also talking about the use of financial investigations, as the ambassador just talked about, as also another source of evidence, not only because it's to make it less risky and to go after the money trails, and also to use it towards compensation, but also to have another source of, inf of evidence, not just uh, relying on the victim's testimony. Um, I would just want to mention one thing um, that in I, as uh, an American I was, I've often gone and followed what different American companies are doing and asked, um, I was at a forum once after the Rana uh, tragedy, Rana Plaza tragedy in Bangladesh, and I asked the CEO of Walmart uh, what he was doing. Um, what they were doing since their brand was connected with the garments made there and um, basically between you and me I was laughed at um, and but within the year uh, they had changed their tune and I think it's both um, you know on one level it's the attention unfortunately sometimes it's a tragedy like starting in the US in the New York shirt waste factory sometimes a tragedy makes something happen or in the case of the, the UK, but these kinds of, um, but I would say that this law that was passed in California is, is an example, the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, because that has single-handedly uh, made businesses stand up on this issue and do something. Is it enough? No, but it's the first law in the world on this issue, and I think um, one should take note of that, and we'd like to promote it, and I know that the UK is now using this uh, to underpin their modern slavery bill, which is before the, uh, the parliament in the UK, and another tragedy in the UK, um, uh, helped launch the Gang, Laster, Gang Masters Licensing Agency, which is more in the food sector, but that's also a very interesting um, thing to look at, and I think it's made a huge difference in the UK, so that's just something I want to mention. Okay, Joy? Yes. You, know, um, you know, we have our new laws now um, that are very good, and in, in, in any jurisdiction, the laws are very, very good. And uh, I think targeting the perpetrators is the right way to go, because any country who's done that has had supreme success. It's happened in uh, Norway, Sweden, Iceland. Uh, that is very good. But you know, when it's all said and done, after the laws are put in and the rehabilitation programs and all that is put in, the greatest weapon I think we have in any country, from what I've seen, is education. Because if people understand what's happening, uh, then they prevent someone from getting lured into it. The case scenarios about how it works, it shouldn't be under the guise of prostitution, it shouldn't be under the guise of forced labor, whatever. It's modern day slavery and this is how it happens. So the public has to be educated, every business, every school, every family has to be educated as to how this happens. Um, I have a particular um, targeting the market, was what I call it, is going after the perpetrators uh, really heavily, which we do in Bill C-36 is something I really think is very good. But in the, in the umbrella of it all, I really think what you folks do when you go to your communities and you talk about what professors do in universities when they talk about how this crime is perpetrated when you start talking away from the dark corners and in the closets because no one wants to talk about it. When the victims start talking about it, when the families of the victims start talking about it, it goes down because people understand they can't be lured so easily. And 90% of it, 95% of it is luring. They're unaware. 
So I think that is the greatest thing that I've seen happen in any country, education. Okay, thank you. For <coughs> very useful. Michael, you want to come in on this too? Uh, yeah. I just, if I could add, I'd certainly support your comments um, and just add sort of in a more general way. I think, um, though it's not, it's not a specific best step, but um, to focus on prevention is, is generally the most cost effective, I think, approach to take. And, um, and, and your, the investments you make of the investment and pay off um, better than uh, the, the, the high cost associated with response in, in, in a general way. Um, I, and the second comment I would make is it's sometimes not always um, the most complicated thing, but simple things. And, and just one example, again, it may not be the best sort of uh, approach to dealing with the issue, but we have supported uh, what's called a truck stop campaign, oh, yeah. which um, is really just the creation of coasters put on tables in diners where truckers um, uh, sit down and have a cup of coffee in their meal, and, they, and they're made aware uh, to keep their eye out and be uh, more attuned to the signs of human trafficking. So something as simple as that has been very positively received and uh, is just a, sort of a, uh, an indicator of uh, something that could be quite simple, and, and we don't always have to look for very complicated solutions. Okay. <clears throat> um, we have time for one more question. Please approach the mic, please. Thank you very much. All the panelists have been fantastic, and also the questions from, from the audience. Um, I just wanted to... Could, could you please to, just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Frederica Gregory. I um, worked a lot with the OSCE in Vienna on this issue recently. She was. She's just the newly retired former Canadian ambassador to the OSCE, and yes. she's a great um, advocate on these issues and many others. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Um, I just had a question because I think one of the challenges that face um, the countries that are represented here in this workshop, uh, Austria, S Switzerland, uh, Canada, are the, of, of one of the P's, um, obviously is prosecutions. And that uh, it's really hard to prosecute, to make it sort of a higher risk for those that are perpetrating um, this terrible terrible um, issue here. Um, I, I'd like to hear from you if there have been any successful approaches, perhaps in Europe, in Austria, um, maybe even in Canada as well, uh, uh, to increase the chances of cases like that high level, that Hungarian case that got a lot of um, attention. Um, and it was a success, and I know, Joy, you were really active on it. Uh, because that would shed a, uh, send a, a sort of a, um, a shudder through the construction, you would hope, the construction industry, because it is a small group. They all are very competitive. They all know if one construction firm is undercutting the others. Maybe they're all doing it. I don't know. But I'm just wondering, how can we get more... Um, more um, convictions. Uh, is there something that can be changed in legislation or something that can be changed in terms of how the RCMP operates or can operate in terms of gathering evidence on this particular case? And I just was hoping that Ruth could also give an example of a success story that she worked on in the field um, uh, within the OSC context of sort of um, uh, cracking a, a case where you involve the uh, countries of destination, the countries of transit, and the countries of origin. Thank you. Okay. We only have two minutes, so if you can answer briefly, and then we'll break for coffee. But, um, Joy, do you want to go first? Yeah. Well, a very specific case was Tamiya Nagy coming in from Hungary. Um, when I met Tamiya, she wasn't where she is right now. And uh, she was... Um, well-educated girl. Um, she was a broadcaster, a student. Her mother in Hungary was a police officer. And she was targeted by the perpetrators, and they said, come to Canada, the true are strong and free. They told her how to get through the border, and she did it right. She did all the right things to come through the border. They got her into a car. They took away her identification. She was taken to a brothel. She was raped, and she was told what she was going to do. That is human trafficking. 
To me, Anagi now, she started uh, Walk With Me. She's one of my heroes. She's an amazing young girl. Uh, there are so many cases like that, though. Uh, and it's not just, you know, it's amazing. It hasn't hit the papers yet, but there's a, a, a lot of trafficking between U.S. and Canada, Canada and U.S. We had a case uh, in Montreal, I'll call her Mia, but the organized crime got a hold of her, and she was targeted. Uh, by a boyfriend, quote unquote, and big fights with her parents. And the last her mother heard of her, she said, I'm never coming back, ever. Little did she know that this girl would be trafficked into Canada. She, um, she's such a brave girl. Um, she testified in court in Montreal for, I think, 54 hours. The judge threw the case out, and she's in the courts again. But, and she was intimidated by organized crime. The fact of the matter is, this is human trafficking, and this is across the borders from different countries. But in Canada, same thing happens, same scene. So you can list the cases over and over again. And, uh, and you know, put human trafficking on your Google. You'll find out all the cases. Go to my website. We put them up all the time. But I hope that answers some, some of your question. Ruth, one example from of a successful prosecution. Well, um, I, I, this is a case that's ongoing, so it's not yet successfully prosecuted, but a lot of the, it's, it also illustrates how difficult these cases are. There was, there is a case uh, of several hundred men from the Balkans, in particular from Bosnia and Herzegovina, that were recruited by, and this also is very tricky because there are different, there, um, if you know, there was a war in that part of the world and the country is a federal uh, state, including uh, a Serbian, ethnically Serbian, more or less ethnically Bosnian and ethnically Croatian parts of the country. And uh, Respublika Srpska, which is a part of, um, it's like a province of Bosnia and Herzegovina, there were recruiters who recruited men from throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina and also neighboring countries and brought them to Azerbaijan to work on huge construction projects that were uh, under the, um, that were under the very high level um, ministries and government officials in the country. Um, there is, uh, we worked uh, immediately as soon as we got notice of this, our office, our OSCE office in Baku, um, we helped them create a full-time position on trafficking in the office um, to get and get funding and to raise capacity building in Azerbaijan. Um, there were, there was, um, there were uh, attempts to facilitate mutual legal agreements through Interpol and so forth, but nevertheless, um, I'm afraid to say that the, um, it was very difficult to work on the, on, the, on the side of Azerbaijan at that time on this case, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we continue to work with the prosecution, and now there's been an indictment in the, uh, by the federal prosecutor of, Bos of the Federation, and that is, uh, I, we uh, worked very hard with pro bono lawyers. We actually fund, we actually then also funded lawyers. Um, so we think free legal aid is very important. The workers themselves created an association, which I think is very important. There was also one of my, uh, one of the best U.S. cases also, and um, ended up in a, in a workers association, which helped um, work out also worker complaint mechanisms. But anyway, this case is not yet solved, but there were 13 uh, alleged traffickers who are as a part of this indictment that they've collected evidence on. They're, they also are looking at it from the money laundering. We've also worked with them on the financial investigation money laundering aspect of this. We had, um, anyway, but part of what we did on this is that um, the, the special representative has high level access, so these issues were raised by her and myself at the very highest levels of both of those countries at the ministerial level. Uh, we, we brought together the national coordinators of these countries, all the countries that were involved and had a, had a dialogue with them about this. We engaged civil society and free legal aid and also supported the NGOs and the lawyers um, to do this. And we just kept at it. We continue to remind, and I know um, I want, one thing I, I, I want to just add about um, what, what I think is important, though it's often overlooked because I mentioned cooperation, is just the importance not only cooperation between agencies as in Canada, which is critical, or of the 
national re <coughs> referral mechanisms and this, you know, this cooperation between law enforcement, prosecution, and NGOs in cases, which is vital also in this case, but also at the international level, a lot of international organizations, including through our Alliance for uh, Against Trafficking in Persons, in, uh, which is hosted by the OSCE, <coughs> we consult with the other organizations. So I think this case now was also brought forth. I not, I, unfortunately, I don't think this is, case is very good to the European Court of Human Rights. And um, the, we coordinated also with the ILO, with the IOM, with, with different other, or UNHCR even on these cases. Um, and so I think that's also, it takes an army and it's, it was very important to work with all these different, um, you know, both across with our other, other international partners who are also looking into this case to keep the high level pressure on and yet to also um, try and support the workers themselves who are interested in getting back wages and getting acknowledgement of, of this case. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. We'll have a coffee uh, and we'll commence again in 15 minutes, I think. And please just join me in, in thanking the panelists for this very informative and excellent presentation.